the how does Call of Duty get its guns wrong? It literally do they not code it by like gun does this much damage if attachment then modified damage by value whatever like how how could that possibly be spitting out wrong answers that's horrible also especially for a game like call of duty guns is what you do this is this is gun the game Hello, Halfpike here, and I just wanted to say real quick, if you've been enjoying my content, please remember to subscribe to the channel here on YouTube and follow me on Twitch so you can always catch us when we're live and see more content. Also, if you are new here, welcome in, and if you're enjoying the video, please remember to like it because it helps me out a lot. I also post funny clips and other things on TikTok. All the links are in the description below, and thanks again. Now, let's get into the video. All right, let's see what games need to stop doing. Make sure this is good quality. Yeah, I knew it. I knew it. Video games are full of useful features and things that, you know, make sense. But there's also stuff that they do that we hate. Hi folks, it's Falcon and today on Game Ranks, 10 things we wish games would just stop doing. Starting off at number 10, it's cursor based menus. Like, so who came up with this one? Like, what do you mean? So many games have cursor based menus now. It's practically the new normal. Destiny probably popularized it or at least made it okay and by okay i mean excused it rather oh. than actually made it okay okay so they mean cursor based menus on console okay i was gonna say on mouse and keyboard i literally don't care at all in fact i find it easier if anything because i can directly choose things maybe it's like minimal coding from their end because they already have to code cursor in one way and they just have to you know slightly modify it for console i don't know but, uh, yeah, no, that's super annoying. That's like a quality of life thing. And it's such an easy thing to fix. I can't say I've experienced this one so bad because I'm not as much of a console player anymore, but that would piss me off. Okay. But basically any game with a similar loot system seems to want to copy it. Cyberpunk has it. Gotham Knights has it. Hogwarts wow. Legacy. All three recent Assassin's Creed games. This wow. is, this, it's an endless list. Instead of being basically selection based where you scroll through a list of choices, these menus try to emulate the PC experience, which when you're on a PC makes sense. But if you're on a controller on a console, like why? Yeah, it's really, no, you, you specifically don't want to do that if you're on a controller on a console. <laughs> really annoying. And like... Games could easily get by with a hybrid system that's faster to navigate or just create something with less clutter, but so many games just go with the basic copy destiny design decisions. And it sucks. And that's, I think, really what bugs people about cursor based menus. They just take longer to get through than a normal one. I mean, again, unless you're on a mouse on a PC, you have no way to immediately go yeah. to the menu item you want. Like in games where there's no fast way to open up the map or inventory screen, you got to pass through multiple tabs to get to the thing that you actually want and it's not fast. It really <laughs> only amounts to a few extra seconds each time. Yeah, I know. But let's say you're checking the map multiple times in an hour or, you know, yeah, trying no, to literally. locate a precise coordinate. It's a lot of time that's potentially wasted. I mean, I can see the appeal of cursor-based menus for developers. You don't have to design two separate menus for PC and console players. But hey, there's actually also exactly. people who play with controllers on PC as well. Uh, make it so that it doesn't suck for everybody who plays your game, maybe. And number nine, loads of points. Not to mention, I feel like we're still at a point where um, controller, like, I feel like, I don't know if this is true, but I feel like for a long time, for sure, the majority of players existed on controllers, um, specifically consoles. And I would probably wager that's still true just because of the global availability that consoles have versus PCs. Um, it's slowly evening out, I think, maybe. But... I would wager the majority of your players are going to be controller players, so to give them the short end of the stick seems like a specific, like, you're screwing yourself over ultimately because that's going to lead to, like, bad reviews of your game, less people wanting to play it, more frustration, and people, I don't know. And it's such an easy fix, like, that's such a dumb thing to hope, like, I really hope in the sequel they fix the fact that the menu was just terrible. Like, you would think an update could fix a menu being terrible. Um... But clearly not, since they're not doing any updates to games that do this. Just, I don't know, what a bad decision. 
pointless loot like i just said it pointless and oddly enough almost every game that has the annoying cursor based menus also has this problem you, you play any major triple a hybrid action rpg they're gonna go loot crazy and not oh. all of it is gonna matter yeah i'm not talking about games like elden ring though where there is a lot of worthless junk you can pick up but it doesn't really get in the way i'm more talking about games like wo long where the amount of loot you get starts to be an active detriment to the fun factor like any game that loads you up with loot that you have to constantly fret over where each new piece of gear gives you slight stat increases and they seem almost inconsequential but they're necessary to keep up with because there's a difficulty curve that's dependent on it uh, you know what I mean Hogwarts Legacy Gotham Knights Assassin's Creed Odyssey Avengers, I didn't play any like, of these some games some of the games are good some of them aren't but they're all games where you're getting equipment that slightly increases your overall power level so you're constantly switching stuff out for most players you're okay. not going to space out and pick whatever makes the overall number goes up because actually looking at all these these numbers is just an exercise of utility. Most of it's meaningless anyway. I mean, does 22% melee damage on Batman-infused enemies actually make di a, a difference? Does it make sense? Do I know exactly what that means? <laughs> no. There's just too many things in that sentence. No, I kind of agree with that when, like, stats... That's kind of how I felt playing, um, what was it? Monster Hunter World. Like, I thought Monster Hunter World was really cool. I used, like, the bug scepter, and the movement on that character was awesome. The graphics look great. The monsters look cool. I liked the little cat thing. But I just remember it being so grindy and so complicated. And I felt like I had to, like, study just to understand what I was doing. And then if I walked away from it for more than, like, two months, I forgot it all. And just like, wow, I don't remember how to do anything, how to craft anything, or anything like that. Um... I don't know. I liked Warframe, though, back in the day, and I feel like that was a sort of similar game, but for some reason, I didn't see that one as complicated or as complicated. I don't know. But yeah, I do agree that, like, there is a habit of, like, I, I, for me, it's not necessarily loot. It's just more of the system. How many different numbers am I keeping track of? How many different values are there? And how complicated is, there, is the crafting system if there is one? And that's actually kind of mild. Some of these games get much worse than that. At least in games like Hogwarts Legacy, the pointless junk at least kind of gives you new cosmetic choices for your character. But in something like Avengers, where a lot of things feel very pointless, this feels even more that pointless sucks. because the loot is pure numbers. They don't change your numbers. I didn't realize there was an Avengers game, but it sounds like just based off of this video alone that it's terrible. <laughs> at all they're just another layer of annoying busy work and they try to keep players engaged because you know the whole the the hell? as a service model we made a video about that go back and look at it it's a good one it was from march 15th i i think that if you didn't watch it it's one you would enjoy at number eight is forced walking sections if you're playing a modern triple a oh, title yeah you know that oh man i'm replaying red dead redemption 2 and yeah forced walking sections suck dude um especially if i'm also on a horse why like just give me a cutscene. give me a cut i don't actually care about controlling the character if it's a force walking scene just force it to be a cutscene and let me watch something because the fact that i have to like keep my hand on the controller and i'm like half participating i don't know i just find it very annoying and boring and frustrating like i would love to take that time to like take a drink or eat something but i can't because i have to do stuff but not a lot of stuff barely any stuff the walking section is just a fact of Terrible. life it's something we've all come to expect and to a certain extent totally accept from these games just part of the deal you know that doesn't mean it's not annoying though obviously i'm big on story-based games Same. And in fact i'm mostly okay with these moments characters are walking and talking it's a slightly interactive cutscene. but if you're gonna put these sections in your games man it'd be great if it was skippable because that's oh, what the these replay? sections are yeah. they're pretty much cutscenes. in previous generations forced walking sections were more about masking loading screens so it made sense but now there's okay. really just not an excuse to make it so you can skip these parts when you're playing a well, game for the first time and you're immersed in the story okay it's possible they might still be masking loading screens i don't know because that actually sounds smart but i do think if they they should be skippable at least on the replay some games don't let you skip cutscenes until you've beaten it once i'm totally cool with that mechanic
story? Yeah, obviously. It's it's good. I'm going to play along. I want to know what's going on. But when you're playing it again for like achievements or yeah. to challenge yourself on it's a harder so difficulty annoying to setting get or something, forced into it's it. a big no. I don't I don't want to to walk through these areas. They break the flow and they're tedious. Like yes, there's going to be times I do want to experience the story again, but to make it so you can skip them is the ideal here. And from time to time there's a game that does it. Honestly, the, often, the more choice you can give gamers the better. <laughs> like what? Oh god, this is spoilers. Pretty inconsistent even in those games what they consider to be a cutscene and what that? isn't. Most games let you skip unplayable cutscenes, but the line between cutscene and gameplay is getting blurrier. So, I think game devs need to make it so that stuff that is technically playable but is really a cutscene could be skippable. At number 7 is when there's no manual saving, one auto save Ooh, and, okay. Yep. Um I I feel I had mixed feelings about this. I know people have strong opinions about not having a manual save. Um, I think most games need one. Most games need manual save mechanics. But some games kind of benefit from not having it. Like, a lot of people are complaining that, oh, you can't manually save in Dead Space. It's terrible. Actually, I kind of like that there because the manual save mechanic can make the game more scary. It can raise the stakes even more. And it makes it such a relief when you do find a save station. I don't know. I think it kind of adds to the experience of the horror game in that instance. And there's probably a couple other examples where manual saves work better. Um, my only gripe about that is obviously people with kids, families, even children who like, you know, might have multiple households that they are going back and forth between. There's plenty of reasons why someone sh needs to be able to save because like they might need to get up and leave in the middle of the game. Um, but... I don't know. I do think that one can... I guess the way to, to uh, combat against that would be you have to make sure there's frequent manual save stations. But I, I do... I have found that that adds to my experience in Dead Space this time around. No mission select. So if there's one thing a gamer should be made to feel secure about, it's their save file. More and more games that normally wouldn't have had a manual save function, they have them now, but there's still way too many games that don't let you create backup saves or only ever keep at Ooh. most one auto save. So you don't get the ability to load previous levels and you can't replay missions. A perfect example of this in a recent game is High on Life. Even though it's a game that's mission based, it doesn't let you make saves or replay missions or anything like that. So if you miss something optional, you're just SOL. And even even games Damn. that do let you save can be pretty weirdly restrictive and limit the amount of times. Sometimes you get plenty of space to make separate save files, and sometimes they're it's not like that. Like <laughs> Red Dead Redemption, where you got three, like three total save slots, and, and that's it. At least that game lets you replay missions if you want, though. Most open world games aren't that generous. Even though so many of these games are like 50 hour long monstrosities, if you want to see something again, search for a collectible, complete an achievement, you all you can really do is game. start the game over. From what I've seen, creating a proper save system isn't an easy task for games. I distinctly remember the first two Shadowrun episodes having only auto saves at first because the developers didn't have the money or time to implement a proper save system, wow. but they did eventually add one in later. Now, not every game needs a full-blown rewind feature like that dumb Alone in the Dark game, but hey, give us some options. What? And number six is forced openings where you can't access the menu. Most of the time when you boot up a game for the first time, it just throws you into the main menu. But certain times, games like to get clever and start with this forced opening where they throw you right oh, into the game. Yeah. In theory, it's a good idea. But No, it's, it's really cool sometimes, but it also, like, it works in Miles Morales. Miles Morales, it starts you, you're, like, on the subway and you're chilling, and then it picks up right from there. That plays awesomely. I like that. But in some games, it, like, doesn't give you a chance to check settings, confirm keybinds, or other stuff. And that sucks, obviously. Um, but the Infamous series was amazing. I loved Infamous. Infamous 2 was pretty good. And Infamous Second Son, I, I, I was, took me a long time to play it. I liked it. I didn't like that I felt basically forced to being a good guy. I always prefer being a good guy anyway. But in that game, it, like, actually doesn't make any sense to be evil. It, it. It does not make sense for the character. It doesn't make sense for the situation. I don't understand in what universe he would actually become evil. Um, so it seems like you're really written into a corner, which kind of sucked. But the powers were really cool. And the storyline was all right. And the graphics were pretty good. If you're primarily a PC player, you know exactly what the problem with that is. 
If you've ever played a game on the computer, you know that you have to go into the settings and fix something because something isn't going right? to be right for your setup. And that's I not a flaw. Too. That's inherent in the fact that pretty much every PC gaming setup is slightly different from some other one. So if a game starts off immediately, you have no way to access Same. these options, and it's pretty damn annoying. A, a recent example is Hard Space Shipbreaker, a pretty cool space salvaging game, but when you boot it up for the first time, the game just starts. In my case, all the settings were screwed up. It took about 10 minutes before I could actually go in and fix it, too. The start of the game should be something that makes the best impression possible. <laughs> yeah. Because first impressions of a game that are annoying and stressful rather than immersive. And yeah, these forced openings are supposed to be <laughs> immersive in some way. Um, they're just annoying. I guess on consoles, they can be fine because they're set up for that console. Yeah, no, on a console, such a consistent experience. Obviously, they have it ironed out, but they should obviously for PC. I was, I've been explaining this a lot lately. Like, obviously, every P, a PS5 is a PS5 is a PS5 is an Xbox S, Xbox S, Xbox S. They're all the same. Um, they know exactly what environment they're running their games on, and so it's, it's a much more consistent place. But graphic cards, graphics cards alone, there's tons of different options that could be in a PC. Same with processors, same with RAM, same with uh, hard drives. And so you have to somehow build a game that's ready to take on any combination of hardware. And so obviously it's it's a less consistent environment. Um, but you would hope that they, you know, develop with that in mind. Don't throw you straight into the game and force you into a thing where you can't change any of your settings until like 10 minutes in. That's terrible. You know, like chances are this isn't going to run super smooth on most machines. Just chances. So, like, I don't know. Seems like a bold move. But on PC, wow, they're bad. At number five, making you use fan wikis for essential information. Sometimes it feels like understanding games is homework. Sure, everyone oh, hates God, overly yeah. hand-holdy tutorials, and we've talked about that to the death in the past, but if anything, the opposite is kind of worse. Just to be clear, I'm not talking about games where you have to look online to figure out stuff that's supposed to be secret or things that any person could theoretically figure out for themselves. I'm talking about things about the game that it just straight up doesn't tell you how it works, or, or worse, it lies. I mean, we have a whole series of videos lies? on this channel called 10 things blank game doesn't tell you from a content perspective i don't want them to start telling you i like making those videos but from a player <laughs> perspective well let's just say my opinion's a little different Team Ninja games are I feel like terrible I need an example. about this. These games are filled to the brim with stat modifying equipment where the actual descriptions are misleading or just nonsense, gobbledygook. Like take this relatively simple example from Wall Long Fallen Dynasty. Certain equipment says it enhances deflect difficulty, which sounds like it means it increases the deflect timer, right? No, it just makes it so you use less spirit AKA stamina when you deflect. Oh, oh of course. How, how could I not know that? Other games are, are actually Well, worse. that's pretty cool. I do agree that that doesn't communicate that at all. That's really weird. I feel like that's just, I, I don't know. I kind of get that because it would be so annoying to type all that shit out because you have to type it out for each little thing. But it is, that is the lazy answer. <laughs> Worse, like Call of Duty, where they just notoriously lie to you about weapon stats sometimes. You know how when you look at a gun and it shows you a graph and its various strengths and weaknesses, sometimes they can be relatively accurate, but other times they are not. They're completely off. And, and like to the point where it's not how? even close. How? So the only way to find out how good a weapon actually is, is, you know, to look it up online. And it's not as if fan wikis don't have their own problems. What? Unless the game has a rabid fan base. Wait, the how does Call of Duty get its guns wrong? It literally... Do they not code it by, like, gun does this much damage? If attachment, then modify damage by value, whatever. Like, how, how could that possibly be spitting out wrong answers? That's horrible. Also... Especially for a game like Call of Duty, guns is what you do. This is this is gun the game. <laughs> if your gun stats aren't accurate, then what what the fuck is even the point? <laughs> That's so stupid. The information to be outdated or just not there. And to think, all you had to do is get all of that no information was to wade through a dozen ads auto-playing videos. <laughs> Will the wonders of the internet never cease? 
At number four is tacked on and frustrating crafting systems. Here it is, the final piece of the AAA trifecta of annoying features. There's the cursor oh. menus, the endless loot, and, and now this, the annoying crafting system. Every game's gotta have it, and depending on the game, it can either be really frustrating and fiddly, it could be a tacked on but ultimately necessary distraction, or in the rare case, a <laughs> actually kind of positive addition to the game. Crafting systems that don't add to the experience need to just stop, but if a game absolutely has to have some kind of crafting in it, at least make it relatively fun. By far the most annoying know. thing about crafting games, at least to me, is when you have an entire crafting tree or a track that stops dead because you're missing one or two random items. Any sort of Monster Hunter style game is really brutal about this. Yeah. Crafting is 100% essential in these games because there's no traditional leveling up. Your equipment alone is what makes you stronger, but if you're missing some random doodad, then sorry, no improved weapon for you. Things are the same as the last mission. Oops. I get why they do it. That's the core gameplay there, but at it's least replaying over and over again. Stuff. Either make it so you can use multiple things to craft. I didn't super mind the crafting in uh, Legends Arceus. I found it a great way to make money. And it kept me exploring. Um, up until the point I completed the Pokedex. Once I did that, I was pretty much done. But I don't know. I didn't have a problem with crafting in Pokemon Legends Arceus. I actually thought it was kind of cool there. And it gave like the origins of Pokeballs. Kind of made sense. I don't know. It was, it, it was cool. Craft or make all the crafting ingredients mostly generic and fairly common. Or give us yeah. a friggin' map. Like, anything. I, I know it's too late to think that any developer could just leave out crafting entirely, but if you have to include it, at least make it relatively easy to deal with. And number three is annoying daily and weekly objectives in multiplayer games. Yes, Again, see the video yes, from March 15th dude. about why people don't like live service. Oh my, as someone who actually challenge chases on occasion for like battle passes and stuff, I, yeah, I have so many thoughts around this. Sometimes it feels like they actually pick one of like, it's like they're trying to promote a game type that no one actually wants to play. And so everyone's just suffering in these lobbies of a game that's not that, a game mode that's not that good playing in a way that doesn't even make sense all for the sake of going for a challenge and i don't know also someone who's challenged chase i've had to deal with like a lot of people getting so mad you know because like wow are you really trying to snipe through a portal like on split gate and like yeah i have to get 50 kills through portals so that's what i'm doing this week that's i'm pretty much screwed into playing like this until i get this figured out um, and it's so annoying, all for the delicious active user count. Exact, basically, ex basically, yeah, because it makes everyone grind harder and like stay in the game longer. Like it, it makes sense why they do it, but you could at least make them fun and not like just make, just make me have to get like a ridiculous high number of kills total, and then I can play any game mode I want and still get the challenge, you know? That's fine. You don't have to force everyone to play two game modes that no one likes. <laughs> like, that's terrible. Games. Also, why me, would you do that to your player base anyway? The really annoying part of progression systems in multiplayer games are the now industry standard dailies and weekly objectives. Depending yeah. on the game, these are fine. They can be okay. Like they get you some bonus experience for doing something you might already do anyway. What is that? Or try to push what players to try out something different, a different mode, a style, etc. At that basic level, it's fine. But like, we wouldn't be talking about it if it just stayed at that basic level, would we? Like often they get really hyper specific and encourage players to act counter to the way the game is normally. And that's a problem. Like I remember Halo Infinite multiplayer at launch being this really is a great lousy example. with really dumb, annoying daily objectives. Yep. While at the same time being really stingy about resets, uh, in a more focused team-based multiplayer game like Halo, these things cause more problems than anything else. You have team members doing really stupid crap, getting themselves killed just to complete some random objective. Exactly. Exactly. Not. Like, why didn't you shoot him? Oh, I have to get like 16 melees today. So like, you know, I'm just running around punching even when I'm like definitely walking straight into my death for it. And then like the whole team loses. I... Yeah. As a challenge chaser, I've run into these problems so many times, with Infinite and Splitgate spe specifically. Support the team in any way. Uh, it makes the gameplay suffer pretty bad, actually. In, in larger, more sandboxy multiplayer games, these kinds of things are maybe a little less egregious. But for everything else, unless they're Game basic this. stuff that you do, that like join five games or get ten kills, they really just have no place in competitive multiplayer team games.
And number two is online only requirements for primarily single player games. This one's just really tough to explain. Like it's a widespread problem in a lot of different types of games, including games that have literally no online component. And yeah, it's unlikely. <sighs> oh my God, Need for Speed. I know exactly what you're talking about now. Yeah, no, Electronic Arts actually ruined Need for Speed. I don't, there hasn't been between you play and electronic arts i think those are the two absolute worst when it comes to online requirements and uh like accounts you have to make to play a game but i haven't played a need for speed game in years that hasn't required logging into ea services and always had some extra menu crap for it i don't know i just find it so irritating especially because need for speed is supposed to be one of the more arcadey race games that should be one of the most plug and play no internet required basic race game ever with the capability of going online not the like requirement it's so fucking irritating i don't care i personally don't care how good i am compared to anyone else who plays that game i know i'm terrible i am not an amazing race game player um that's not why i play them i play them when i don't want to think at all and that's why i'm bad at them because i i don't want to think really hard when i'm playing them i just want to like mindlessly drive around in a cool car fast that's it um and i feel like they've ruined that they've taken that from me and that's what i specifically used to love the series of need for speed for like on ps2 and stuff so i don't know that one hurts a lot i agree a lot needing the internet just to play a game or i don't know stupid services like when I first played the Dark Souls game, I thought like, man, these bloodstains are stupid. I can't believe I have to connect to the internet for them. Those actually ended up being useful and funny. But there are other times where it seems random and stupid. Good example, Pokemon Legends Arceus. Like the idea of losing your crap and then r hoping and waiting for some random other player who's also playing Pokemon Arceus to play the game, connect to the internet, Go to the same area that you were in, see your list of items as like something a trainer lost in the wild recently, go to where you fainted and then grab it. That almost never happens. So it just resulted in people losing stuff with no way to get it back. And that's fine, but don't bait them into thinking that they're going to get it back. You know, don't false hope us with this stupid internet connection thing that almost no one's using that most people won't have internet access, but there's just no reason why games that are mostly single player need an online connection Literally. to play them. There's none. The thing that really bugs me about this is that they're on life support the second they come out. Whenever the developer or publisher <laughs> feels like they want to pull the plug, that's it. No more game. Recently, Redfall got a lot of flack for its online only requirement so much that the studio is trying to remove it and good on them for doing so. Damn. But the big question is why was it online only in the first place? It's a game that does seem to support co-op, but they've always made it clear that it is a single player game. Gran Turismo 7 is another annoying example. In this case, online because game. of microtransactions. Even though most oh people are gonna god. play Gran Turismo. So that's even worse, dude. Oh god, that's so gross. They have microtransactions for car parts in a game now? That's so fucked. Hello. You have to be online to access the store. They That's want you to so keep playing, and the limit in the amount of in-game money is a way to push microtransactions. Diablo 4 is another online-only game coming out soon that most people are probably just going to play solo, so why would I want to have to deal with lag and cues if I'm playing a game by myself? What is the point of that? Like, why? What is that? It's super, super annoying. Every game should have some kind of totally offline option option if the game doesn't need to be online and that's even if only the game can still be played when the servers it never. really always comes back to just give gamers options options are better let people choose i know it's harder to code but you you won't lose if you provide choice probably go dark they're gonna so maybe even add it in as like a feature during wind down i don't know i don't care like it's stupid <laughs> this is dumb and finally, at number one, no pause button. Now, if you're playing an online game, duh. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> you, there are, you, you can't pause online games. <laughs> there are a ton of games now that just don't let you pause at all for really? no reason whatsoever. I've a lot never of them experienced do have this. online modes or interactions, like all the Souls games incorporate some form of online interaction with the main game. But here's the thing. You can still play them offline where none of that's going to matter, and it still doesn't let you pause. I know for oh, some games weird. the inability to pause is meant to be part of the challenge, but is it really so much to ask to give us the option if it's absolutely necessary. I know I've kind of unfairly singled out Wo Long in this video on some things, uh, but in this entry, Let you I do got one pause. 
I didn't even know you could do one pause. This kind of reminds me of in the Watch Dogs. So like you couldn't technically pause Watch Dogs if there was someone, uh, that's really interesting. Um, in Watch Dogs, you couldn't pause if someone was in your game, right? Because now it's an online game and you can't pause everyone's session. So, um, that was one way I would try and keep track if someone was invading my lobby to try and steal my data is I would just pause all the time. And if the city kept moving while, uh, I was in the pause menu, like if the city was still moving in the background, I knew someone was in my game because it had shifted into an online session as opposed to an offline session where everything would have stopped. All audio would have ceased. So basically two max per game. That's really interesting. I think that's not a bad system. It's almost like timeouts in sports. And that makes sense to me. Um, especially if it does like a when someone unpauses like a countdown, like a synchronized countdown, like a five, four, three, two, one, you know, just to resync everyone. I think that I think that makes sense. Gotta give it props. It's one of the few Souls-like games that does have invading and multiplayer co-op and everything that you would think would make it so that they're not gonna let you pause the game, but they let you pause the damn game. It's one of the only one of these types of games where if I really need to pee, I don't have to have one of those disposable Dude, urinals. literally. That oh, and I love when games let you pause during cutscenes. Games, all games need to let people pause during cutscenes. Sometimes I have to pee really bad and it's super uncool to keep me trapped there for God knows how long. Yeah, it works for StarCraft, but I don't know if it will ever make it to FPS. That is more messy to implement. Absolutely. And I could kind of see how it would even ruin things like uh, Elden Ring. If people were like fighting, you know, like fighting each other with swords and stuff and someone paused. Like I could see you cheesing that. I could see people being able to cheese it. But I think limiting to how many times a person can do it per match is a way to combat against that cheese in a way. Bags that truckers keep on hand so they can make good time. I, it can't be that hard to implement, can it? I mean, games have had pause screens for almost as long as there have been games, right? You know why most people call the start button the pause button? Because people have gotten used to being able to pause the game with that <laughs> button. So what is the excuse for the modern games? They think they're too good for pausing? Like sometimes emergencies happen. I don't know about you, but I'd rather not die just because I had to get up. It's like seeing a movie. Yeah, it makes sense that they're not going to pause the big screen for you when you have to get up to pee in the middle of the film. But when you're home alone, no one else is Experience, relying yeah. on it. You're playing a single player game. You should be able to pause the damn thing. And that's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this. Yeah, no, I kind of agreed with all these. I think this is a solid, solid video. Solid video all around. Way to go, Gamerans. Thanks for watching, guys. Follow me on Twitch to join us live. Like and subscribe, and I will catch you later.